notes. Okay, Can we begin. Yes, Rina. Okay. Namaste and a very warm welcome to each one of you who have joined us today for the discussion on this seminal work by two very eminent personalities. The book titled The Two Futures of Food, Health and Humanity, A Civilizational Dialogue. I take the pleasure on behalf of Rashtram School of Public Leadership in starting off this event with an introduction of Dr. Mala Kapadia Du, who will be leading and moderating this event today with the authors and all of you. Dr. Mala is Professor, Director of Center for Wellness and Wellbeing at Rashtram. It's one of our key centers. She has a master's and doctorate in psychology and literature. She's also a writer, international speaker, and executive coach integrating yoga and Ayurveda has been a researcher in the area of holistic well-being and integrated intelligence for more than 30 years. She previously served as adjunct professor of the SP Jain School of Global Management and uh, across campuses in Dubai, Singapore, Sydney, Mumbai. She's also an author of several books, including Heart Skills, Emotional Intelligence for Work and Life. She's been a pioneer in this field of emotional intelligence to MBA students across Asia. She's also served as consultant for different multinationals and uh, on the model of sustainability of performance and holistic leadership. Her knowledge about well-being, Ayurveda, yoga, leadership, and holistic leadership has been making her a unique advisor for us at Rashtram and also a natural choice for this crucial event. I thank all the panel and request Malaji to take over from here. Thank you, thank you, Dhanivada. Thank you, uh, Reena, Sara. Uh, next, just go to the earlier slide, please. Uh, we begin with our normal Rashtram prayers. Uh, that's the ritual we follow here at Rashtram. Uh, Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunatu Sahaviryam Karava Bahai Tejasvena Vadita Mastu Mavit Visha Bahai Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Namaskaram. It gives me immense pleasure uh, to be here from representing Rashtram to representing Center for Wellness and Wellbeing and uh, introducing two great. Uh, how do I say? I, I am lack of words for me. Uh, Vanna ji and Gigi Gangadharanji, their work has been so profound that it, it's extremely emotional moment for me uh, to introduce them here to the fraternity. About the authors, they need no introduction. And yet, of course, uh, as a formal part of the program, Vannaji started her journey with studying physics and took it all the way to quantum physics in her PhD. And that has given her the, the macro perspective with which she connects everything uh, from our food to our health to humanity. And therefore, she has been a relentless warrior, I would say, uh, which has talked about earth citizenship, earth rights, seed saving, Right and and Navadanya, which represents nine grains together in this culture, which is taking us to away from our biodiversity, away from our ancient traditional richness, and uh, she is re-establishing what the earth needs, what the planet needs, and what we all need. Next slide, Saura. This is Navdanya International and uh, my life changed, I would say, Vannaji, when I attended your program 
uh, A to Z of agroecology way back in 2014. And I realized that suddenly I've become very vocal uh, in helping not just people to understand why it is important to know where our food is coming from. Uh, Vannaji has done a lot of work on biopiracy, uh, making people aware, uh, helping communities, helping farmers, and helping humanity to make conscious choices. Next. Gigi Gangadharan ji uh, also needs no introduction. He's a very well-known name in the field of Ayurveda. Uh, uh, I've been wanting to be his student in Ashtangradaya courses for quite some time now, and maybe 2021, I promise to make that a priority. Uh, Gigi Gangadharan ji has done phenomenal work in Loka Swastya Parampara, traditional knowledge of food and medicine both, and also at the moment being the founder of Ramaya Indic Center. He's also uh, doing a lot of research, connecting Prakriti, which is the Ayurveda concept, with Genomi. And, and together, these two authors have given us the best gift, which I truly believe was not just showing us the dismal view of the world which we are facing in pandemic, but giving us an opportunity to choose consciously a path for ecological living and more sustained humanity for tomorrow. Uh, so this, with this, I, I begin uh, the questions. Uh, thank you, Saura. You can close the slides, please. Thank you. Vanna ji, I, I begin with you. You have uh, said in uh, the interview, in the forward, that every problem you studied in ecology, food, and agriculture, erosion of biodiversity and climate change, can be traced back to mechanistic reductionist paradigm. I mean, these are such profound wisdom that we are losing today, unfortunately, and which facilitated extractivism for commerce and profit. Commerce and profit has taken over so much. And again, they are being projected as scientific, as the truth. And therefore, my, uh, my first of all, my gratitude to both the authors for this work, which is showing us the interconnectedness of food, health, and our future as humanity. But why do you think, because for me, it's also showing that there are the two parts, right? The book title itself says that there are two futures, and therefore there are two parts. Which one do we want to continue? For last many years since the advent of industrial revolution, we have continued walking on the mechanical mind patterns and profits, and that have dominated our worldview and our life. However, there is also a path of ecological mind, biodiversity, and health. How do we help the masses which are brainwashed, which are colonized? How do we begin even this civilizational dialogue that you have started? You know, I work in so many Indias. We are not only a very diverse country, but different parts of India have been impacted by colonialism in very different ways. And sadly, you know, the richer you are, the more urban you are, the more colonized your mind is. And you think like the colonizer, which is exactly what Macaulay's minutes were all about. You know, you create a class of people who think like us and will do our work for us and therefore change the education system. So first of all, I'm so happy. There are new educational initiatives growing. Navdanya Beach with their Beach is one, Rashtriam, uh, the uh, Indic studies that Dr. Gangadharan uh, is heading for Ayurveda. All of these are very important initiatives for our time. As you mentioned, I'm, I'm done physics. And I didn't do quant quantum theory for nothing, yeah? Now, in classical physics, there's mass, yeah? Fixed things, fixed entities. In quantum theory, there's potential and non-separation. 
So I don't use the term masses for the people. I use people and the potential of our cultural civilization and the fact that those who are most left behind in the race to modernity, which is nothing more than the race to co of colonization, are in fact the ones who hold the civilization with love and care. And this is from my lifetime of experience. You know, I'm, I've always worn saris from uh, when I left school. And we've only worn more handwoven because my mother said, if you wear a factory clothing, industrial clothing, which was just coming into India when we were growing up, uh, you help a millionaire get his next Mercedes. You wear handwoven or khadi, a woman could feed her child that night. You make the choice. So when those, everyone, and I've always thought of the sari as my six yards of freedom. When I work with peasant women, and they're out in the field working all day in the sun and the rain. They're working with saris. And yet we've yes. been brainwashed to believe it comes in the way of freedom. Look at the number of articles being written against the sari. Yeah. And uh, the blue gene has become the global monoculture of the mind. But nobody's looking at where does that money go? You know, I, I, I go to our Navdanya farm all the time. And I've seen even in the villages, the shops change from handwoven clothing, printed saris and kurtas, and this time really the leftover night pajamas from the West as the clothing of the daytime. And we've been so colonized that we really think the junk of the West is modernity for us. So, you know, time for me is a chronogram. It's, it's a moment, yeah? Wearing a sari is as modern as wearing a jeans today, right? The modernity is not in the jeans of the sari and the primitiveness is not in the jeans of the sari. The system of justice, the system of ecological sustainability that is held in food, that is held in clothing, is what decides whether something is futuristic in the sense will it last, which is why our book is titled The Future. Are we shaping a future or in the sense of borrowing the past of the West as our future, making ourselves obsolete, not just as a civilization, but without a civilization, the existential conditions of humanity get destroyed. Because India is a civilization that always thought of our existence in an interconnected world. And that is what we need to reclaim. Otherwise, not only are we threatened as a culture and civilization, the human species is threatened. Nothing less than that is at stake when we wrote this book. Wonderful, Mannaji. Thank you so much. And yes, I mean, uh, you rightly pointed out the genes conspiracy, right? I mean, and I'm quite shocked that one of the international brand of torn genes costs one lakh rupees in India. And what you said, the urban India is ready to pay that, that kind of money, uh, which doesn't really uh, sit into any common sense logic, you know, and, and, and that's where people are not even aware that they're, they are brainwashed, they are colonized, and they need decolonization of their own mind. Uh, so, uh, Gangadharanji, let me connect now with... Uh, the ecological, right? Vannaji talked about the mechanical mind and the path that we already are on. But the ecological mind, biodiversity and health as a conscious choice uh, of path for humanity, uh, as the title mentions, uh, I realize that it is already there millennia ago, written in Ayurveda as Hitha Ayu and Ahita Ayu. Right. And, and we realize that for long we have been living Ahita Ayu and Dukha Ayu, uh, which is seen in the VUCA world, which is seen in the pandemic world. So how do we create a civilizational dialogue with the colonized mind uh, and help them live a Hita Ayu or a Sukha Ayu? Would you explore uh, a little more on the Hita Ayu, Sukha Ayu? See, uh, one of the challenges uh, that uh, we as Indians who want to see our roots are respected, 
not because of it is ancient but because of it is contemporary relevant and how to make it mainstream that is the challenge and uh, what you see today is uh, what is respected any time and every time and all the time to come is success success is what respected so we have been a successful nation some 20, since uh, just before some 200 years back we have been respected we have been considered as a guru of all all the nations people used to come to india for learning i don't repeat the success of the kind of places where people from all over south east asia come to learn more than 5000 students at a given point of time learning many things and what this all happened because people looked at india as a guru as a teacher as a enlightened entity not just individual but is a collective wisdom this was not there there is a black period for us in last 200 to 300 years so now we are to bring back our lost wisdom back into the circulation we need institutions and individuals who are who are good at putting this knowledge to the mainstream way of understanding mainstream languages mainstream technology mainstream paradigm all together see we in india as you as you rightly wrote hidahidam sugam dukkam ayustasya hidahidam manam cha yatra yatcha yatroktam ayurveda sauchi the definition of ayurveda is based on hidam and agidam sugam and dukkam and ayurveda as as i have very clearly told in my first first and second chapter where i talk about ayurveda i leave the science is a collection of uh, generations and generations together communities never up never up developed practical knowledge which got strung together through a thread of ayurveda's basic principles so basic premises of ayurveda and any indian systems of knowledge is that ano bhadra kradavo yandu vishala let noble thoughts come from everywhere we are ready to accept and we say that egam sat vipra bhagutha vadi truth is one intellectuals put in different names so we are so open minded we have been absorbing knowledge and we have been putting it to the contextually relevant way that's why ayurveda you see ayurveda from kashmir to kerala in practice it differs one may even wonder why the same ayurveda is being practiced in kerala is it no actually it is same but it is so well knitted with the living conditions the ecosystem the geographical specification and the cultural milieu of the community you are living all those things got embedded into the different techniques of ayurveda so once we successfully create a platform for ayurveda to flourish through the wellness and well being concept which you have been trying to propagate which i have been trying to with our indic center we have to show this is the way to have a sustainable future complete health even health that we define in ayurveda is not a individual health we very proudly says i have quoted in my book in different places what uh, narayana uh, this says that health cannot be limited to individual well being health in its actual sense is the well being of the individual in tune with the universe so we say that yavando bhavaha murti madam dehe tavando loge yavando loge tavando dehe this is the thought process we carry so we don't differentiate the ecosystem and the micro system that is we the living being i think this is the crux that we have to put back to the society at large if you want to live sustainably you have to respect mother earth which is actually as per indian tradition and the most modern the top 20 2020 award winner of this earth movement it's a living thing we don't think earth is a thing to be exploit, uh, exploited we say that it has to be sustainably utilized like uh, we 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 milk a cow we say when we milk a cow we don't do any harm to the cow no, neither the cow nor the uh, cowling that is our concept this concept has to be brought into the purpose for that we have to be successful practitioners of the system the system has to come into thing i am so happy that post pandemic period there is a great awareness towards well being and wellness than curing microorganisms because when once you cure one organism unless the host defense mechanism is strengthened which we are all talk about the gut microbes the human system 
the health system our the way we talk about ahara the way we talk about abrahma jatya the way heart nidra these three components is very comprehensive very comprehensive it touches all aspects of life so if this interconnectedness between the micro and macro is properly brought into the notice and understanding on the well being this dialogue dialogue then all this dialogue can further go and there is lot of benefit it is not that we are telling you to sacrifice if you do it the all future is yours if the earth can sustain till 2020th century the earth can sustain after 20th century also if we follow the principle which kept this world this universe alive this world was kept alive because of the principles which we hey, we have been promoting and propagating i think this is what uh, we have to do we have to bring in respectability of this knowledge we have to bring in infrastructure which will propagate this knowledge in an undistorted way we have to contemporize this knowledge so that others understand this why it is so i think this book which we have john written give lot of lights and lot of hopes towards this dialogue i don't think it is the end of the dialogue as vandana ji has many time told it is the starting of a dialogue and this kind of a question to a strong uh, strong vested interest in the west and partly other countries also who are the influential people who who, who very arrogantly decide the future of uh, billions of people has to be questioned to question that we have to have some strength that strength comes from our wisdom i don't think other than india maybe probably china to some extent we do other others don't have this wealth of knowledge which is uh, all providing all time which can be used all time to come we give that scope the three chapters which uh, which needs like a fabric in the book is gives that hope i say it is only hope because it gives a hope that there is a future which is depending on the biodiversity conservation sustainability of life understand the human system as the part of the lo- total cosmos not uh as staying away as an exploiter and we believe this science is a silent sentinel the right word for our science is silent sentinel this sentinel has been protecting us safeguarding us for thousands of years let us bring this sentinel to the forefront of fight and use this sentinel's knowledge wisdom to fight against this mono very monoculture based very 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 reductionistic and very narrow minded approach of nano particles in the food and fortifying the food making what kind of uh, unnatural breast milk are there all those uh, very 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 distorted way of looking at things has to be challenged and we give i we are given a very good parallel uh, to the iron metabolism how iron deficiency can be treated with holistic method with the proven uh, ex- experiments etc so there is a viable practically applicable uh, parallel available in a world which is not well known in the west in a world which is uh, is aware with uh, other interest which is not exploding to the other other, other wisdoms i think this kind of dialogue can be more respect and can be more like and this 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 is the only way to challenge the colonized mind and uh, uh, and uh, supersede them or influence them with our effort I think that's what I believe the right thing to do. Right, right. Thank you, Ganga Daranji and uh, Vanna Ji. I love the on in the book on page twenty four. Uh, why I'm being so specific about the book and the number of pages? I I want to inspire the listeners to explore all the other twenty three pages before uh, you know, because then they are more curious to understand what is unfolding before and after. So on page twenty four, Vandana Ji says, and this is so profound. Four simple questions are asked by democratic societies, and this is important to note by democratic societies. Uh, uh, you know, before applying any new tool or technology, one is it necessary? Two, is it better than other available alternatives for our health? and freedom three is it safe and free from risk and hazards to health four does it aid nature as gangadharan ji said nature and human beings the interconnectedness 
has always been our foundational philosophy. So does it aid nature and the larger common good? We see these questions being suppressed. Not enough research and scientific inquiry happen at global level, impacting Mother Earth and all of us. Agribusiness, medicine, and even well-being. Uh, I, I must share this with you. Uh, I'm sure you would have seen this and felt the shock, which I also felt. Uh, I, I teach uh, internationally. And once at Sydney Airport, when I landed and you get out of the airport, and right, I see a big store of well-being. And I was curious to know what is there. And I was shocked to see that there are melatonin, serotonin, everything available in capsules. You know what, what should have been our natural hormonal uh, cycle uh, because of our food and lifestyle is also being a trillion billion uh, business uh, for the West. So Mannaji, my question is that one concern is lack of research, right? The nutraceuticals uh, or whatever is being introduced uh, in the market. Uh, there is lack of research. And another concern is use of technology. So how do we inculcate the spirit of inquiry in every mind? Because your four questions are very profound. And I, I really would love to take this as a part of education all the way back to schools. If we can teach our children to ask these four basic questions, right? Uh, like after your agroecology course, let me share that uh, I wasn't even aware of the American corn taking over all the variety of corns in our plate. And at your uh, seed bank, uh, it was so heartening to see all varieties of seeds, the indigenous seeds of corn. So how do we help the younger generation become more aware? Um, you know, those four questions are really the distillation of my lifetime of research and inquiry and action of protecting nature and assessing the impact of technology and methods of production on nature and society. This is what we used to have a discipline for this. It used to be called technology assessment. And Mala, we had a very big heritage on technology assessment. In fact, you know, we do a course at the Beach Vidya Peet on Gandhi and globalization. And we begin with teaching from this little booklet that Gandhi wrote while going by ship from England to South Africa, while he was mm -hmm. fighting for Indian rights against the new racism and laws that forbade Indians to practice professions, do trade, and Indians had to be registered. Um, and he started the Satyagra in, in 1906. And, uh, and I think he wrote Hinsura in 1909. And 1911, the British were forced to withdraw that law of discrimination. So Hinsuraj, in fact, is a gem. And I would suggest everyone should read it. And if those who want to do the course, in normally we do it in November now, um, that they join it. The second is, I have participated in all the treaty making at the Earth Summit in Rio in 1992. I've also participated and shaped many of the laws in India. The Earth Summit created two laws. One on climate change, it's called the treaty is the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And this is what keeps getting discussed, collapsing, discussed again, and next will be, I think, Glasgow. I had an invite from, it's an Indian who is the president of the Glasgow um, event because he is based in England. Um, and the second was the Convention on Biological Diversity. And I went into the Convention on Biological Diversity deeply informed by the idea of Vasudeva Kutumka. And I'm so grateful that from the 90s onward, not only have we shaped um, a philosophy that is rooted in our tradition, but, and I, I talk about it as earth democracy, but more importantly, we shaped international laws and technology assessment laws. The same goes for climate change. I remember, you know, I spent three years at the Indian Institute of Bangalore, where Dr. Gangadharan, the city where Dr. Gangadharan is. 
And we had a wonderful director in IIM Bangalore called um, Dr. Uh, who? He was called the cart man, yeah? And uh, he worked on animals. And because of him, when I was working with our government and our minister and environment secretary for the preparations of the Earth Summit, we showed that India had absolutely not polluted because we were part of a biodiversity economy, not a fossil fuel economy. And because of that, we have the moral standing to force the Western colonizing fossil fuel nations to take responsibility. That is what they shed in Copenhagen and are continuing to shed in Paris. And now they're trying to create new systems of colonization. I've just seen, I've just read a new book called How to Avoid a Carbon Climate Disasters. And you would think it would have some science in it. You would think it would have some true solutions in it. It's a new colonizing text. It has a picture of a bullock and a plow, which we have had since Indian in this Valley civilization. We have mm -hmm. seals of the bullocks. That's how long lasting it is. And as Gandhi showed and Dr. Ramaswamy name was showed that not only is the cow and the bullock such partners for us, they give us soil fertility. They give us animal energy. They give us milk in the non-violent way that Dr. Gangadhar and so on. We have festivals, Pongal, Mattu Pongal, is for the worship of the animals. So Mr. Gates, who's supposed to be brilliant, actually, first of all, we know that factory farming, putting animals in one place and then feeding them animal feed with GM soya and GM corn leads to methane. The emissions come from the intensive feed. His book has a section where he talks about the cow having four stomachs and therefore emitting methane. Mm -hmm. But the Indian cow never stinks of methane. The Indian cow is a sacred cow. And I would say, Mala, if there's one project you can take up, it is this, on the sacred cow and climate change and the myths of climate change. He actually says, yeah, many farmers still use these ancient techniques, talk language of colonization. As you know, at the Navdanya farm, at the A to Z, I refuse to have fossil fuel and tractors. We have bullocks. We have five generations of beautiful animals. The female give us milk. The males give us energy. They're our family. And he calls it an ancient technique. And he would like to see the cow and the bullock disappear from Indian farms. And the day that happens, there's no soil fertility. And then he, uh, totally with bad science and fraudulent science, talking about the cow's stomach being the reason for methane emissions rather than factory farming and industrial agriculture. But then he goes further. He's got a photograph of himself in, in, in front of fertilizer. And then he's saying, I'm happier than I look. And this is a solution. I've written a book called Soil Not Oil, mm -hmm. where I've shown that 50% greenhouse gases come from chemical agriculture, come from globalized systems of trade in food. And we can get rid of that 50 system by doing organic and rebuilding and regenerating our diversified local economies. Synthetic fertilizers emit nitrous oxide, which is 300 times more damaging to the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. And we are listening to this rubbish. He actually, I'm doing a new, um, a, I have to do a paper because uh, He's now because the biggest landlord. Now, you would think a digital baron will not be bothered about land. He's become the biggest landlord. So I'm reading the text of why he's buying land, and I'm going back to Lord Conradlis. I'm going back to uh, Baden Powell and the settlement records. And I'm saying, oh my God, this is exactly the language they used then. Exactly the same thing is happening. Lagan, then. Lagan now, but Lagan now is more diversified. It's for the land, it's for the seed, it's for the data, and he calls big data the new goal. <coughs> and I noticed, Mala, you've worked on emotional intelligence, another project for you, and we can work on this together. It would be yeah. nice out of this webinar and the book launch to have a trilateral partnership yeah. on indigenous knowledge, you know? beginning with this book 
uh, on the key issues that are our civilizational keystone. Why did we worship the cow? Because she holds ecosystems. She holds the soil. She gives us energy forever. She gives us a nourishing diet. And they are attacking the sacred cow and a civilization that will be kicked for its sacred will be destroyed. And what is happening, the main thing about what Gates is doing, he wants us to become worshippers of a new religion he would like to be the god of, the pope of, the king of, the religion of technology and tools without thinking, without using our Vigyan Kosh, without using our wisdom about which Dr. Gangadharan talked. So get rid of wisdom, get rid of knowledge, get rid of your sacred, get rid of your culture, take my tools, get indebted, get enslaved, and generate billions for me. That is the colonizing moment we are in. And we hope this book will contribute to a wake up call. In the multiple dimensions, and literally by the week, I have to do a new book. I have to do a new report because the colonization is so rapid and so fast. Yes. And I do feel through your programs and through the book, the young people of India who care for India and who care for their own future will say, Absolutely. we will create the freedom movement of our time, which is to be based on the regeneration of our civilizational values. Absolutely, Vannaji. Really, you know, this is exactly what I'm feeling now, that the youth have to take back the future in their own hands. Technology, yes, uh, but they have to realize that technology without consciousness is extremely dangerous. Like how in Bhagavad Gita, we have Daivi Sampat and Asuri Sampat, right? Uh, and these are the psychological qualities. And we realize that the, the colonizers uh, are showing more and more of the Asuri Sampat uh, and the greed. Uh, and, you know, they are they are not they are brainwashing everyone so much to believe that this is science. This is for their good. And this is for the good for humanity. And that's where uh, giving the right choice to the youth uh, is very critical for all of us to come together. It's it's like more like a, uh, the wake up call, as you said, is more like a dharma yuddha now, right? <laughs> uh, so I, I I would love to weave it as a fabric, as Gangadharanji said, to back to Gangadharanji about the soil, right? For us in India, the way Vannaji said, the cow is sacred. Mother Earth has also been very sacred. Bhuma, Bhumata. We always say Mother Earth, right? Bhu Mata. We have Prithvi Suptam. We have Bhumi Suptam. Uh, so from the Vedic times till now, we have been worshipping Mother Earth. I mean, a simple prayer that we most Indians used to recite, uh, at least for generations, has been, you know, seeking forgiveness from Mother Earth for walking on her, right? I mean, uh, we don't want to trample her uh, beneath our feet and we seek her forgiveness. Before we begin our morning, uh, this is on page 19. Uh, and I want the readers to note down these interesting pages. I'm sure you will discover as you read the book your own uh, interesting pages. But page 19 I found very interesting. Where it is written, we know that the soil is living thing. Professor Ratan Lal, who received the 2020 World Food Prize, said, I believe soil is a living thing. That's what soil health means. Soil is life. Every living thing has rights. Therefore, soil also has rights. And Mannaji has been very vocal about earth rights. In the second chapter on Ayurveda, uh, Gangadharanji, you begin with Bhartra Hari's uh, Sukta, right? And Dharmapalji's quote, which is very profound. So will you will you expand on that so our younger audience here today can understand which path is good for them, right? I'm, I'm sure these two quotes are so powerful. They would help them to make the choice in a better way. See, one of the uh, big uh, plus point for Indian knowledge system is it is not individually created. It is not individual specific. Over a period of time, many uh, stalwarts, intellectuals, seers, 
fortified this knowledge into a textual form for the growth of science to further areas. So Ayurveda, we, when we say Ayurveda, a lived science, which is my topic of that chapter, we can say that this has come into existence as a codified system over thousands and thousands of periods and years by different communities. For example, we have got more than 442 ethnic communities and we have got around 4,200 caste communities or the ethnic tribes and ethnic communities totally. 10% of them are the tribes and the others are the other communities. So each community has developed the knowledge based on the challenges they face, based on the situation where they are living, based on the resources available for them, and they use it as for their well-being and their curing diseases. So there is no, no single individual. And if you look at Charaka Samhita, it occurs in different places that the knowledge is not in the text alone. You go to the people in the forest, people who are looking up the, the cow herds, the shepherds, the, the locals who are living with the nature, learn from them about the medicinal plants. Learn from them. That's what he says. So it's, it, it shows how earthly we are, how realistic we are. And it then comes to a science which is completely uh, uh, comprehending the whole thing to one thread of Panjama Buddha. And it then says from that uh, local practices, local local swastha parambaras, the local health traditions, which enrich the science of Ayurveda, gets connected to the universal principles of heat and cold, Panjama Buddha. From Pandamaha Buddha, we avoid Tridoshas. Tridoshas we saw not only in the human being, in all living being. There is a Viksha Ayurveda, in Pashva Ayurveda, Mirga Ayurveda. So every living things, other Stavaram, non-moving, or Jangamam, or moving a Jangamam, which is moving. All those things are in the umbrella of this knowledge of Ayurveda. So the main thing Ayurveda says that. This is Anadi and Anandam. It has no starting and end. It is not because of any other reason, because it is ever evolving. So we'll see an evolution of knowledge from, uh, if you go to the, the earliest text that is known to human uh, intelligence is the Rig Vedas. The Vedas. So 10 to 12 plants from Rig Veda, 60 plants to Ajur Veda, 560 plants of Charaka Samhita, 1,200 plants of Vakpada, 1,700 plants in uh, Sangadar Samhita, around 2,000 plants in the 19th century, last uh, latest book of uh, Nikandos is Shaligram and Nikandu. And the 9th, 20th century survey of uh, done by the government of India, which is documenting 7,000 species of medicinal plants used by ethnic communities. So it is, it is highly evolving, vibrant, and, and assimilating. And it is not getting frozen in time. If you see even most modern uses of the plant which came to India in 21st century also is being used in local traditions. And even the gramophone record, you know, the gramophone record which used to get music, the powdered gramophone record is used as a very good, which a lead is there in an external uh, application for psoriasis. The used oil in the Transform and the transform of the electricity that used to transform oil is used for uh, rheumatic pain of the joints. So they, this 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 how they came to know about this because of the they are re, they are reacting with the nature. They are they are joining with the nature. They they are keeping on adding. So you will see so many things are getting added. So then Ayurveda says very proudly. There is nothing is non-medicinal. Everything is potentially medicinal, provided you know where to look and how to look and how to take it. So this is the that is the beauty of uh, indigenous Indian knowledge system. So to answer your answer your question specifically, that we have to remove this concept that medicine is something in the shelf of a pharmacist. Medicine is something, something is a molecule that we have that you distill from a 
decoction. No, medicine is there in the thing. So we say that even medicine is non-pharmacological medicines are there. There is no elements are involved. That also is medicinal. Even thinking is medicinal. A thought process is medicinal. So the most modern psychiatric principles are coming to that. What are the non-pharmacological actions that is changing the body? So all those things are given in Ayurveda, but which are not expressed in the way it should be expressed. That is what is preventing us from becoming, getting into the mainstream. And why we say that Dharampalji has very clearly told, there are two you know, uh, books that one should be uh, one should be reading if you want to know more about India's scientific literature. One is Science and Technology in 18th Century and the one is The Beautiful Tree. These two books are very clearly with the authentic references from British archives give that how systematically they mutilated the health traditions and other trad cultural cultural uh, uh, traditions of India, how they uh, purposefully uh, axed, purposefully removed, and they removed the umbilical cord of the newborn from the mother when before the delivery is taking place. Like that is what they have done. So they killed their culture. But I am happy that this knowledge still is existing in few locations as a very few droplets. If you kindle this fire, which is not gone into uh, this thing, then there, there can be big, uh, big explosion can happen. That's what we are creating through this dialogue. The knowledge, see, this I am not telling because uh, I belong to India or I see all ancient things are sacrosanct. This I have one, one's own experience. I traveled, my profession started in 85, not seeking for a job in any company. I worked for this log, Sastha Parambara, Sambandhan family. I volunteered. And it gave me, I think that was the best part of my professional life. Ten years I was only traveling, traveling not in cities, only villages in the Northeast. And in the, all, the, all the states, except Jammu and Kashmir, at that time I could not visit. All the states I visited stayed 10 to 15 days together, lived in the village. And like Pandanaji has seen and uh, addressed, we have seen this, this, this culture is reverberating in them. It is they who are actually nurturing it, keeping it safe, thinking that someone will come tomorrow take it further. That is the state of their mind. They are still, and they are very active. You know, this uh, animal husbandry and the veterinary medicine. The more actively practiced right in the Northeast in Imphal region and in Tibera region, there are practitioners who are better to suit the needs of the community. I am quoting one of my books that is coming in future that a ordinary woman in a remote village in Rajasthan can treat many conditions in dental industry, which needs to we have to spend thousands and thousands of rupees to get it corrected within one drop of a medicinal plant, which I have seen through my eyes. And one, the, the, the importance of that is that village, never we can reach with your five lakhs uh, price, the equipment and the dentist serving them, never it happened. But the, that lady has been serving it very profoundly without any side effect. And that lady went back with a um, uh, uh, swollen mouth, which was our dental problem, which occurred within our time. So like that knowledge has been coming, it is not stagnant. So this is what is, uh, keeps us uh, uh, different from other communities. We are vibrant community. We are still alive and actively pursuing these practices. We may not see in the 20% 20, 20 of the urban folk we are, what we are today. 80% or 70% still nurturing it. Only thing is Yojaga's Tatra Dullapha. We say in Ayurveda, one of the words that Yojaga, a person who can bring it together, and put it together and take it further as he is waiting for. So if you are able to champion this cause with the substantially uh, substantial evidences that will stand for us, we can withstand this. We can win this fight. We can withstand this pressure. Thank you so much, Gangadharaji. Of course, we, we commit to take this forward, right? Uh, collectively, individually. And as you rightly said, we are a vibrant culture who's holding on to our traditional knowledge. However, the main difference is that we are not looking at it patenting and getting into profits out of patenting it, right? And that's why it's been Vannaji's bigger fight uh, for many years now. 
uh, and we realize that the game the patent game is becoming more and more complex uh, which we are not even realizing uh, patents create monopolies by destroying alternatives monsanto tried to make it illegal for farmers to save seeds and and this example i have been uh, telling to a lot of my uh, students uh, which i again it goes back to the agroecology course uh, with vanna ji in 2014 uh, i used to travel a lot to singapore and dubai for longer periods like a month to teach and being a typical uh, indian uh, homemaker i wouldn't want to buy uh, yogurt from outside so i would try to take the milk and you know the yogurt and try and cuddle the milk uh, into a yogurt at home and it would never happen uh, and i gave it up and then only when i came for your course vanna ji i realized that the tetra pack milk and the tetra pack yogurt doesn't allow you to be independent and and that natural cycle of milk and milk products right in our life is broken and the same is broken at seed level right i mean with the gmo seeds uh, hybrid seeds the same natural cycle is being broken uh, through navadhanya you have been defending india's culture of saving and sharing seeds as a spiritual duty uh, that's that's rashtram's one of the aims and vision to establish seed banks and help farmers save their own indigenous seeds and their own knowledge uh and the uh, enshrined in the law that you mentioned article 39 of the plant variety protection and farmers rights act and as if the seeds of freedom fight was not enough now we we have to fight for this patent which is uh, being there for the bio milk right the bill gates climate change investment firm as you mentioned here in the book uh the bio milk so even the most natural and the the first nourishment which a mother gives to a child uh, imagine that being made up in factory and i'm not really sure how many people know of this uh i didn't know till i read your book and that shows how ignorant we are with what's happening in our lives would you want to uh, talk a little on the bio milk or the uh you know the the burger and fake foods uh i'm sure we need more more uh, awareness to save and yeah. choose a part so you know when when i realized that the chemical companies wanted to patent seed at a meeting in 1987 on gmos is when i decided i'd save seeds but i also started to study the issue of intellectual property of gat of wto and i realized the word patent is what columbus was given you know see columbus was really trying to come to india you know they wanted yeah. to get the spices and textiles of india but he didn't realize there was land on the way and so he became the discoverer of america and he called all the people of indigenous people of the americas indians which is why they still call indians and i call it columbus's mistake but the letter patent he carried was this charter that go conquer other countries which basically meant india take it over on our behalf civilize the barbarians and exterminate them and take their wealth uh so the word patent goes back it's, it has roots in colonization it it doesn't have any other meaning except the letter patent the open letter to own other people's lands and because of this i started to work both at the level of navdanya and farmer seed saving but also with government and parliament and i'm very very proud that as a country we have the best laws on seed because we worked as movements with parliament and government so our patent law which was shaped by intergovernment interparliament parliamentary committee you know i think murli mohan manohar joshi ji headed it but every party was in it and we managed to put in it an article 3j which says that life is not invented by human beings and seeds plants and animals cannot therefore be patentable because only inventions are patented of course since that time monsanto has been trying to strike this law down and the last was in the year 2019 where they said okay 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 we won't say we invented the seed but the seed is an empty container 
and we invented the chemical we put into it, which makes the seed a Superman. And fortunately, you know, we intervened and shut that down. Now, Bill Gates again, who is trying to patent biomill, he has 14 patents on a fake burger, 14 patents on what he calls a plant-based burger. And one of his commitments in this book is I'm going to eat more plant-based burgers. Soya bean, killing the monarch butterfly, made in the lab, blood made in the lab, genetically engineered in the lab, and 14 patents. All of this interference in, the, in nature's power to renew herself, which is what bija is, the ability to renew yourself. Bija, that which, from which life arises on its own, that there is this colonial aggression to stop that freedom of life's renewal. So prevent the farmer from saving seed, prevent a mother from feeding a milk, have it patented, prevent people from eating food they've grown, patent the burger, and if he has his way, he's going to make fake food legal and real food illegal. Now, I'm not just saying this trivially. We've had to fight since the late 90s the laws on food safety, which were put in place by the junk food industry. And these are called sanitary and phytosanitary measures. And our prevention of food adulteration was removed and an FSSI was put in place. The first thing they did was ban Indian oils. Our ghanis, five million ghanis were shut down. And part of our work now is put the honey ghanis back. We're introducing ghanis in the villages and ghani oil with good thil or good groundnut or good alsi or good <laughs> mustard is the healthiest oil, not GMO soya, not palm oil, which are also destroying the forest and are at the root of the pandemics that we are facing, the destruction of the forest ecosystems. So the junk food industry has brought us to this place with chronic diseases. And Dr. Gangadharan and we worked on a book, uh, uh, which is Annam, please order this for your institute. And Dr. Gangadharan has a chapter um, uh, the, there's chapters on, on the supplements, on junk food, but, and we are also going to be offering a course on, um, on Annam from 3rd of April to the 7th of April World Health Day. So please look out for it on the Navdani sure. Health University website. But you've also mentioned the Plant Variety Act. Now, the, you know, the uh, officials had been bribed by the Monsantos and said, oh, there can only be registered seeds sold. All farmer seeds should be illegal. I said, why should farmer seeds that have stood this test of time be made illegal? And we did a satyagraha, we prevented it. And I was appointed on the expert group by Chaturanan Mishra, the then agriculture minister, to write the law, which became the Plant Variety Protection and Farmers' Rights Act. Now, two years ago, you might have heard, Pepsi sued four farmers of Gujarat, yes. one crore each for saving potato seed. When I read this in the newspaper, I immediately sent our new book, which is called Origin, the plunder, corporate plunder of nature and culture. And all of these, you know, works as the 80s, including literally till 2018, is in that book Origin. I sent this book to the lawyers fighting the, for the farmers, and they showed the clause, Article 39 that farmers have a right to save, improve, exchange, breed, and sell, and save the seeds. And this clause forced Pepsi to withdraw it. Now, I want to bring to the notice, both to Dr. Gangadharan and Mala, as well as to those who are listening, that sadly, Niti Aayog had just put out a paper, and a farmer's group called me the other day to mention this to me, they put out a paper and they said, said this Article 39 of the Plant Variety Protection and Farmers' Rights Act is coming in the way of modernization of Indian agriculture. So does he, he, he they see, Niti Aayog see, modern agriculture is an agriculture where Pepsi controls all junk food, where for every 20 rupees of bad chips that makes our children obese and gives us diabetes, four paisa goes to the farmer, four paisa. They're killing the farmer, they're killing our children, and this is called modern. I think we need to ban the word modern and modernizing from the vocabulary because it is another name for colonizing. 
we should yeah. use the word of constantly evolving, as Dr. Gangadharan has mentioned, and evolving in the context of being part of nature and a human nature relationship and part of society. And this context setting is what dharma is about. So what could be more adharmic than wanting to make fake lab milk bad enough, bad enough, but then to patent it, second crime, and third to say, oh my God, here's a climate solution. If all of the breast of the milk of the women is moving on container ships in the Suez Canal and the Suez Canal gets jammed and women don't have breast milk to feed, that is a climate solution. But women feeding their babies and bringing health, that is a climate crime. I think this insanity of anti-science being called science, of climate problems being called climate solutions, that is where I feel our book on a civilizational dialogue is important because a civilizational dialogue is where wisdom and dharma become the basis of how you dine. Absolutely, Vannaji, that, that's so uh, true. Uh, you know, all the artha and karma that we are seeing in the uh, society today, uh, and I wouldn't even say West or East because everyone has become the same, uh, you feel somewhere at some level. Uh, and the dharma, how do we bring it back? Uh, that, that's our biggest challenge today. Uh, so, Gigi, you've been talking about uh, Ayurveda in various chapters in this book where you have elaborated on uh, Ahara, right? You have also elaborated on iron deficiency. I mean, that's again another challenge of the land of the land, you know, managing uh, anemia uh, not through natural way, uh, but by artificial ways. Uh, also, there is, uh, you see, in a lot of uh, people today uh, taking fake supplements. And when you check with them, that the, the, the nourishment should come from the food, right? If the nourishment is not coming from the food, you have to take chemical supplements. Uh, and this is why Ayurveda has a very, very elaborate way of explaining how it's affecting our body and our mind. There is some echo. Uh, uh, okay. uh, so what I realize uh, that today gut health is, uh, you know, uh, people are talking as if they have discovered something new. And I've been very uh, vocal about this that what we realize in the West, because they begin with a micro analysis, like you focus on a germ theory, and then there is a paradigm shift of a host theory, right? So they, they look at body uh, as separate parts, and then they discover that, oh, gut is also a brain, and gut microbes are playing a great role in our mind and our body health. While Ayurveda always knew this wisdom, right? Because Ayurveda looked at the whole person, uh, and therefore, the gut health has always been a very integrated part of uh, way of life and also the way of treatment, both. Uh, how do we help? I mean, you have been very, uh, very the founding member of Loka Swastha Samvardhan Samiti. And you have done some very ground root work on this. So how do we spread this Ayurveda to people? See, if you look at this uh, Western uh, theory, as you rightly stored about jam theory, uh, we have been holding holding very high the Cox postulation. Cox postulation was the first uh, theory in modern medicine. Every disease is due to some kind of microorganism. And 19th century, you see that there is this uh, uh, theory of uh, internal milieu or in internal environment. Claude, uh, Claude Bernard Claude, the father of experimental physiology from UK, brought this, coined this word Indian environment. And he said, uh, the host is important, not the guest or not the micro that's coming from outside. That was the first meeting point with Ayurveda, with modern science. But that was left ignored or not, was not noticed. Claude Bernard's theory kept aside. Even though it was used a little bit in the public health policies in the earlier stages, 
uh, and thought it was not taken into consideration. But if you come to lay after that, you see that when this gut micro biome concept came, where it has said that gut is the second brain to that level, and every study today in modern science is based on gut. And we say that gut is the basis for everything, even your personality is defined. How you think is bound by the gut microbes, which are three times larger than your own body cells. So in one way, uh, we say, we poetically, we say that we are not the we, we are actually the three times bigger than the microbe. Uh, the microbes are three times bigger than our own cells. So we don't have our own cells. So our self is dominated by this. See, all this evolution in modern uh, thing. And if you take the theory of genetics, you know, we have been telling in once uh, some 10 years back, everything is decided by the genes and nothing can be changed. And uh, then now the theory came of epigenetics. They said there is something beyond gene and your epigenetics, how the environment influences the gene, decide upon the whether some disease should originate or not. So you can see there are so many parallels uh, which has been showing the strength and uh, importance of Ayurveda wisdom, which is universal, it is, which is all pervading. In example for Ayurveda, if you take the uh, one of the technical terms I mean, I use, Panchakarma as the best of remedy. That is the elimination of the physical and uh, other impurities physically from the body is Panchakarma. It's a five kind of uh, Sadhana Chigilsa purification treatment, which is the last word in Ayurvedic treatment. And this one of the Panchakarmas are Basti. Basti is a kind of a very wrongly named enema. Enema is not at all uh, completely comprehend the what Basti can do. Basti is the one which brings back the lost equilibrium of gut uh, balance. So Basti talks about, and there are whole book about Basti. There is no book on Vamana. There is no book on Virajana as such. But there are books and books on Basti Chigilsa. And Ajayya Susruda, 5,000 years back, said that Vasti is the half of Ayurveda Chigilsa. If you put everything else, other four Panchavarmas and all other information, if you put Vasti in one uh, balance and this other thing, it will equal. That much importance is given Vasti. As a student of Ayurveda, I was wondering why he said like this. We don't see the importance of Vasti. I mean, there is many types of Vasti. When I study more and more, there is Yoga Vasti, Kala Vasti, Karma Vasti, Hyderana Vasti, kinds of vasti and vasti changes each for disease. I was wondering why one plan changes. It was highly interviewing as a student. But when I study the gut microbial resistance, and it talks about the, the importance of that. And you know, there's a very beautiful shloka in Taragam Uttarartha, which every student should read. It gives only one line very poetically about the importance of vasti. And how it says is that's why I say that Ayurveda can, we cannot distinguish arts, poet, poetry, and uh, science. It all intermingled. And in a hardcore scientific tradition, uh, treatise like Taraga, he says the uh, meaning of Vasti by a story. Story is like this: a cowherd goes with a flute in, on his lap to the forest with a herd of cows, a group of uh, in the morning. And he leaves the cow, when the uh, cows reaches the forest where they go for grazing, he sits in a shed and has the, uh, will have his food and he waits for the shadow to come. Evening, he has to take the cows back to home. Then he takes his fruit and just uh, play on the flute. Cows which have gone in different parts of the forest for their food will listen to the the music of that uh, flute, he knows that the master is calling, all of them come back to the cowhead and they go back to the village in the evening. It's a very nice. And wa and then Charaga says, the vasti works like this in your gut. And he says that like the, all the doshas which are gone in the inner part of your body, tissues, cells and other organs, is the cows which are gone for grazing. And Vasti is the flute music given by this cowherd, which attracts all the doshas back into the gut and eliminate through the thing, uh, eliminate through the system GIT. So such an understanding of uh, doshas getting influenced, these microbes are important, uh, important uh, actors are known for this. 
why i am giving this examples are that the science which uh, when goes further and further understands and i believe today the science is so primitive that tools of science are not capable of understanding the inner strength of ayurveda this is what i have seen when i traveled all over the country as lspss person that this knowledge is so much woven with the fabric of the society's life which is everywhere when the when the way they eat the way they cohabit the way they have relationship the way they make their house the way they have their garden everything is connected to the way of uh, this indigenous health this is what we have to understand this is what the strength of ayurveda and i believe i believe this uh, science is uh, not at all uh, made by a one person at one point of time it is ever evolving which has been contributed by everyone in the in the society from the lay persons as i told you in the villages a ordinary women know how to correct a, a dental issue a, a, a ordinary farmer in the village know how to uh, uh, how to resurrect a broken bone and people have their specialties on condition of many diseases of liver disorder skin diseases all these conditions are met with these traditions which are based on the indigenous knowledge of ayurveda and allied sciences i think this uh, new normal of ancient wisdom has to come if this kind of knowledge are put, put in the mainstream of understanding of uh, people excellent gangadharan ji so the new normal when we look at our indigenous wisdom our new normal can be actually the second path that is mentioned in the title of the book of the ecological mind right and and which is good for humanity for our food for our health however <laughs> at the moment we also see a movement which is absolutely diagonally opposite and vanna ji in this book there is a full chapter where you speak about the patent uh the 060606 the number really seems uh, to be saying much more about the patent uh, uh, would you would you share what are the concern areas and how this can actually be a conspiring thing for the humanity against our human freedom the our basic freedom um you know the reason we have titled the book the two futures of food of health and humanity is because humanity itself is with a question mark now right. and it was this patent which was literally i received it very soon after it was published you might remember the lockdown was 24th of march of last year right. Next. and the publication date for this patent wo060606 is 26th of march 2020 and the, this is the image here's the human being yeah then there's all the gadgets the human being uses the servers and algorithms there's evaluations and cryptocurrencies and the human being is a mind and a user the human being has lost their autonomy their embeddedness in a conscious universe uh, their ability to make decisions as this multi-layered interbeing connected to the earth connected to the universal consciousness and that's why i say this is a threat to not just humanity but to the civilizational understanding of what being human means so i'll just read the lines the abstract you know i've i've analyzed it in the book but this is what it says human the, the patent is a business patent yeah it's for a business model so we are being reduced to raw material for business yeah we are the new mind this human body activity associated with a task provided to a user may be used as a mining process they say a mining process for cryptocurrency a survey may provide a task to a device which will provide it to a user yeah 
a mastermind in the gadget artificial intelligence will assign a task to a, a device which will assign it to us and then we will be evaluated by algorithms what will be mind is our body activity and that's why there's so much sale of smart watches and smart wear and people you know the middle class of india is just totally getting into the system not realizing these are mining devices exactly and we are being turned not just into raw material but we are being turned into users of the process stuff which is behavior mad modification there's a very very good book i cited it surveillance capitalism on how the next step of capitalism and growth and money and profits is reduce us to minds mine our data our mental data our body data our body activity and process it manipulate it through algorithms and sell it to back to us to modify our behavior now facebook does it to modify our behavior for turning us into perpetual consumers but they also do it by changing our democratic consciousness by selling the data to cambridge analytica which then creates the messages so we as conscious beings are being wished away we are being reduced to be users of machine and what's at stake is this i had mentioned earlier that a small group i mean they're the new billionaires of our time and they made lots of money while people lost their livelihoods in this lockdown period they became richer by trillions of dollars they basically have decided our tools will create the new raw material our tools will create the new consumerism our tools will create the new religion and they would like us to be con confused that we forget dharma to adopt their tools as the new dharma and this is where our civilizational measures come into play the dharma evaluates tools tools do not set the dharma dharma measures our humanity our uh, our being doing the right action living the right way tools cannot be the substitute for dharma and we cannot forget our civilizational wisdom our indigenous knowledge by a new enchantment of tools of captivity they're just a new kind of captivity it's a digital captivity um uh, but they're still captivity and it's still collecting profits from us and through our slavery but more important than that literally stealing the part that our civilization has taught us to keep free under all circumstances the freedom of the ecological mind that freedom is at stake right now and that is why we must go to our roots to be free for the future wonderful freedom of the ecological mind is, is is something that we really need to focus on uh and also work on it individually collectively institutionally uh and gangadharan ji this is where i realize ran vanna ji i'd look out for your annam program uh, and see if we can participate would love to have that program for our learners too however uh, you know in the chapter uh, on food and ahara at one side you talk of the fake foods right and on the other side we also as a civilizational value we say anna brahma right i mean we have looked at anna as brahma uh, and when we say anna as brahma somewhere uh, the 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 sacredness that which goes uh, not for the soil which gives us anna but also for the person who cooks the anna for us right like in chandogya upanishad during my book on emotional intelligence i was doing research on food and uh, our mental health and the emotions and in chandogya upanishad it's very clearly mentioned that our body is made up of the food we eat but our mind is made up of the subtlest part sukshmatam bhava of the food and i was wondering what this sukshmatam bhava is 
and then you come out with the aha feeling that oh my god this is the the person who's cooking the food for you uh, and and this is so missing i mean on one side naturally women are encouraged to be career women working women delay your pregnancy don't worry now you don't even need to breastfeed your baby right we have ready made milk for your babies uh, uh and and all those nurturing mothers are disappearing right and in corporate we are supplementing programs on coaching mentoring nurturing talent team building and we expect that to come as a miracle with the fake food and the bio milk and, and that's i think is the biggest contrast uh, and challenge of our time uh gangadharan ji the the a, a ray of hope that i see Uh, and unfortunately i don't see it so much in india but i do see it in us and canada which is the dollar training right the childbirth training uh, which was our own traditional wisdom right unfortunately we have given that up and lot of cesarean babies are being born uh, and we also realize that we are losing that wisdom uh i i listen to so many nutrition experts who are internationally known coming from india talk about ayurvedic wisdom but not giving ayurveda even 0.0001% credit but giving the tips as if they are they themselves have you know discovered these uh, technology of uh, food uh, that we talk about however how do we bring ayurveda into the mainstream because i think the dharma that uh, freedom of ecological mind vanna ji talked about is somewhere connected by reviving the sanskaras right at, at rashram we we teach one course which is on rita chitta and the other which is on sanskara abhyasa which integrates our being because anyone who wants to become a public leader has to begin the journey with the first step of self leadership and the self leadership doesn't begin when you go to school or colleges and learn leadership but the moment you are conceived or how you are born right how is your umbilical cord cut uh, that would decide your emotional and physical makeup So Gangadharan ji Ayurveda has so much to offer to humanity. Would you want to share uh, something on this how do we make it mainstream? I think uh, you have touched the right point of the last uh, this thing. See annam annam vai brahma annam annam na nindya tad vridam annam uh, so everything annam has given so much of importance in our culture that we said that annam gets uh, into three uh, sections as you told one is the stola bhaga sukshma bhaga and kitta bhaga these are three divisions and stola bhaga of anna makes our physiological entities all our tissues and the sapta dhadus and other thing and sukshma bhaga makes our mind how the sattvic mind rajasic mind tamasic mind evolves out of the sukshma bhaga and kitta bhaga becomes the excretory element which we excretes from the body at the end of the digestive process and uh, not only health books even spiritual books like gita say that what is sattvic food what is rajasic food what is tamasic food very elaborately and give the nature content and substance of this food and how it is important ayurveda gives freedom for you you want to be a rajasic person you have this kind of food if you want a sattvic person you want to evolve spiritually you take this person and if you are uh, if you if you if you, if you take this kind of food you with the tamasic person this kind of categories are given in ayurveda and ayurveda as sandhana told never uh, believes in uh, patenting the knowledge and ayurveda does not say that you carry my name when you take my knowledge we have been a free bird and we have been giving freely this knowledge that may be one of the weakness or what of the one of the strength so i know many people the modern nutrition many a time uh, um, borrows this idea from ayurveda and the latest idea you know we what ayurveda says about healthy food is shadrasam uh, madhara prayam swasvadikyo rudavrudo it's a very simple basic principle of healthy food in ayurveda it starts from say the food which has a combination of all six states in a different percentage 
with the madrasa the sweep as other dominant in all of those and according to the amlatwa of sharatwa or madratwa of the ridu you increase one of these other five components so we have in summer when the agni is very low we have something to improve the agni we have got food which is having amla rasa pradhanam when the wind uh, when the winter when the agni is very strong we have got madra rasa pradhanam so like we have made a very very comprehensive uh, arrangement of uh, understanding the right kind of food in the world and it says it is not only the rashi the quantity of the food also how it is cooked and which vessel it is cooked and which from which place it is coming all this add to the nutritional value as a science of ayurveda science of health we have to give the best to the seeker so ayurveda give the best we may think that how is a complicated thing a ordinary person can follow so there we may maybe adjust it but ayurveda the science give the best and what ayurveda says that i guarantee you sadam jeevam sarada sadam adhina syam sarada sadam prabhavam sarada sadam jeevach sarada sadam i am giving you guarantee of 100 years living and if you want to live 100 years healthy ayurveda upadeshesu vidhaya paramadra you follow the principles of ayurveda sacro sanct because i am giving everything that is needed and if you are making adjustment and uh, compromising in that then there will be distortions in you so what ayurveda beautifully say that what is the best way of processing food sapta ahara kalpana sapta samskaras and uh, the 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 vessels in which it is there and it also talks about the mindset of the person who cooks that also add to the value of the food so which are all uh, which are all part of ayurvedic nutrition and ayurveda says that treat the person as a whole take the herb as a whole ayurveda does not say that you don't over polish a thing you don't uh, eliminate certain things take this thing as a whole and it talks about the combinations and wrong combinations and i think viruddha ahara is the most important future going to the future combination of ayurveda to the science of nutrition because we do not know the harmfulness that is giving by the wrong combination like certain kinds of citric fruits with milk it's a very bad and taking honey after heating about 80% 80% 80 degrees there are very evident uh, yeah, disadvantages and viruddha ahara and which are not uh, which is un, uh, unhealthy practices are the, the, the domain of ayurveda so we can see in food it talks about the quantity the rasa and ayurveda divides the everything in the universe either as rasa or virya when virya it is about the drugs all the drugs are explained in terms of its virya all the food stuffs are explained in terms of the rasa and shadrasam madhura prayam sasvadikyam is the cornerstone of ayurvedic nutrition and if you divide and understand and analyze and uh, split into modern modern nutritional component you can see madhuram is always starch and starch has to be the staple food starch is the energy giver and a uh, grain comes in the starch all the grain comes in the starch pulses come in the protein which is also madhuras pradhanam the starch protein so this combination and when you get into the fruits and vegetables all our vitamins and other things are embedded so we don't have to go to the details as you told you no know, we have such a uh, bad shape we are that we remove our calcium from our food and we take calcium tablet we remove e and uh, a from our food and then we take multigrain and you know us as a person from chemistry will know whatever we make in the lab it cannot substitute the natural the vitamin c or vitamin e or vitamin a make in the lab is chemically different in one way or other it cannot be completely assimilated metabolized by the body at all like a natural vitamin a or c or d e. it ultimately reaches your liver to some part of it it will not completely disintegrate in the body and it becomes a problem for you many a time i believe even though i don't have substantial data to prove it because of lack of my time to search in the thing calcium high intake of calcium is one of the reasons for many of the cardiac blocks because the calcium what we take through our leafy vegetables we said that take leafy vegetables in summer leafy is a very part of the thing we don't take it 
and we take instead of that uh, we take we, we don't take milk enough the, the glacier milk is not a commodity then we take cal calcium and calcium cannot be absorbed calcium and cholesterol becomes a wrong combination in the body and most of our problems of health is due to this block which is being created by extra and many of these vitamins i not 80% in the, in americans they say almost 100% are living on supplements but if you take the plant as a whole and treat the person as a whole there's a need for supplement 100 years back where were the supplement industry at all the supplement industry is grown by because of the supplement industries are interested to sell their medicine more to the people so they keep them away so my chapter on anemia say that how a natural diet can help you simple diet can bring your uh, hemoglobin content within one month time two months time three months time so this is the area i think ayurveda has to come with more and more this is what we have tried uh, in our in our earlier work also in the book on annam also this point was given so i think the one principle that we follow which now european countries also follow is that eat from 100 kilometer radius eat from the things which are in a, no. so that then so the local because that makes a lot of sense it is ecologically and geographically relevant for your digestive system and your digestive system is in a genetically in a in, in a in a program in a way that which is easily can digest which are there locally available so i think this concept which are part and parcel of ayurveda has to come to the forefront if you are to uh, negate the reductionistic approach of nutrition which is actually uh, actually keeping people uh, not in health at all many one of my tasks when i as a physician the clinic is to educate people to go for natural food and see the difference rather than hoping in many times see one of the big problem is the b12 deficiency you see two i'll just add two more components to that to show you the 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 the, 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 the severity of the problem in india we never have used to need a d3 d vitamin deficiency no need because it is a temperate country with sunlight is so available and people come when i found 90% of the people who come with vitamin deficiency, not because of their lack of exposure to sunlight, most of them take this uh, RO water. When this RO water came to our kitchen, I don't know. In whose interest RO water is reversed as much as whose interest? What RO water does is that it takes back the minute, uh, the micronutrients from the body and people become D deficiency. Everyone, I ask, second question, I ask that, are you taking RO water? Yes, and stop it. Half the problem is over. Their magnesium deficiency come up, their uh, uh, vitamin D deficiency cover up. Second is B12. B12, vegetarians got very little salt, but we have got salt, the fresh curd. Fresh milk has got vitamin B12 to the extent. But people pop in B12, they come with 2,000 micro uh, Then she said, it is a toxin then. Then I have to eliminate that. And many people get problem because of that. People said they keep on popping B12, they keep on popping D3 medicine, and uh, there is no medical supervision of that. People get into problem. So it is giving more problem than giving remedial medicine. These are small two examples how deviation from natural diet and natural way of living takes you to a very wrong way of uh, living. I think there is a need which we have tried to give that there are parallels available with a very strong scientific footing. Only thing is their walk to make it more vocal, more understand, there are more uh, more 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 uh, loudspeakers are needed rather than few of us do it like that. And we need institution also. One other thing I tell always any platform is that we need institution which will do further studies uh, on these aspects with the more more understanding like the uh, the way the IITs and IIMs are functioning this time. We don't have a single institution to develop this. We want this uh, Navadhanya kind of things in different parts. So many micro, micro level people should be working. Then only this can come out. So one of the things we do in this regard is that uh, I should uh, conclude that the one of the program which we are doing in uh, collaboration with uh, Vandanaji's uh, Center for Innovations in Science and Social Action is Anna movement. Anna, we have made a movement in Kerala at least. We did uh, three of it very successfully where lakhs of people came. Only way, what we do is that bring all the farmers together, all the indigenous food, uh, traditional cuisines, and make sure that people appreciate it and make it a 
very respectable thing to come and have it. Chief Minister's kind of people come and inaugurate it, and we have a lot of stores three to seven. We are planning for a jada of Annam home and from Kasargod Kanyagumari, where people will understand what is Annam. It is very great area. One of my colleagues in uh, Kisra has written a book on Aharam Vishmahambur, when the food become poison. So another bestseller book in Dr. C. Suresh Kumar, who is the general secretary, has written a very wonderful book, seeing how people are misguided by industry, how people industries are giving wrong understanding about their food, when which is more harmful than good, how people are kept away from traditional food, knowingly they are kept away from. They now want to propagate the goodness of uh, jackfruit. You took jackfruit as a one example of a fruit which is very indigenous to India, and jackfruit is such a wonderful. Even diabetes I have seen is very coming down by taking jackfruit. There are empty number of uh, products that can come up for jackfruit. There is a book on jackfruit, 108, 108 uh, recipes out of jackfruit. Jackfruit is one example. We have got 550 varieties of bananas in India. And now we know only that one green leveled uh, European banana, that is uh, that is overpowering all bananas. But we have got in Kerala around there are 40, 50 kinds of bananas. Each banana has got its own qualities. In Guruvayur temples, they use only one that uh, Kadali banana is smallest, most tastiest banana. So all this variety, biodiversity, are being completely, I think, bulldozed by this industry in the name of food processing and food. And we are actually act, act as Vandanaji told, we are made slave of modern propaganda. We are slaves to modern propaganda. We don't know our richness. And I believe we are, uh, as a community, a sleeping giant. If the sleeping giant, as a community, gets up and starts propagating our science, no one can stand. Everyone will come to our feet. But that self-confidence, self-pride, with the substantial knowledge and experience to back up our, our propaganda, only will take us. You know, we have been having giving an empty talk all these years. Empty talk will not help us. Talk is good, but talk is only one aspect. We have to substantiate it. We have to prove it on the field. We have to show it in the field, how it is helpful. We have to give data, how this is helping. One anemia study in one corner of Chennai will not do. We have to have 100 such studies. And we should influence the policies. And we cannot keep away from the politics in that respect. We have to influence the policies. If Vandana Shiva was not in that committee, we would have been sold to the um, uh, Mosanda kind of people long back. So this is what we need. I think. What uh, the ashram kind of uh, institution do is take this to the people at large, make it bits and pieces, don't give all things people may not undertake. One aspect, take banana, take jackfruit, take ragi or millets. Millets is another great thing. How we lost our millets? Right. All millets has been gone. We are all rice eaters suddenly, and we are all diabetic today. 70% of us are diabetic. We eat rice that also polished, not even uh, good rice. We rice polish, remove the brain, and that bran is coming as oil. That is again poisonous. That bran oil is again not good for health. And such a distortion happening. I feel like crying. That's all I can do. Because so much distortion happening. Our generation is at a very, very, very uh, thing. And I believe, I am an optimist. I believe something will come up uh, every time. So someone may come up somewhere, <laughs> then it will come up. No, so we'll begin with that Annam festival here at Rashram too. Sonipat would have their own traditional uh, way of Annam and we can have that, hold that festival here as Gandhadaranji said. Uh, Vannaji, there is a question for you from the audience. Uh, what has been your experience in engaging with public policy in India to herald this consciousness? Uh, what are the specific contributions we can make, right? I mean, Rashtram as a public leadership institute. Well, I think Dr. Gangadharan has just mentioned very, very clearly yeah. some right. areas of intervention. I would say the defense of our two laws on seed, defense of our patent law and the Article 39 of the plant variety law, and why it is important for India's Atma Nirvata is a very important piece of work and i think you should hold a discussion with niti io which is suggesting it should be knocked down and it's preventing us from reaching the 2030 goal when i have done so many papers to show that the only way to reach the 2030 goals 
is by protecting our biodiversity and knowledge, and therefore the laws that protect our biodiversity and knowledge. So that's one. Second is the vital area of food and health. Food is the biggest area of our colonization. And the sad thing is that chemical agriculture came from the West. I've done a book called The Violence of the Green Revolution when Punjab erupted in violence in 84. You understand where did this, all this come from? And of course it made money. You know, the World Bank got us into debt and then it put structural adjustment and then it put more conditionalities and all of the unraveling of India's sovereignty begins at that point. So I feel the issue of putting Ayurveda and India's indigenous agriculture, which you have been through by coming to the Navdani A to Z course, that are two big gifts to the world, are a system of health, Ayurveda, a system of food and farming, which you can give it any name you want, but what's called organic went from India. Though there's a huge propaganda machine to try and convince us that it's imported from the West. Organic is homegrown. Mr. Howard said, I'm going to make the Indian peasant my teacher because I haven't seen agriculture like this. And he wrote his book, Agricultural Testament, which is basically a distillation of Indian Vedic knowledge and the practice of it. So I feel because we are being colonized, around our food and agriculture and those who gain those who brought the chemicals are the same industries who gain when we become sick the chemical industry in farming is the same as the pharmaceutical industry in health they're the same players they're the same buyers they're a group of five yeah so i would say the connection between food and health by diving deep into our own um, knowledge systems and fortunately we have a ministry we have an ayush but it should become more than lip service it should now become policy and i don't see why through this pandemic ayurveda and ayush were not made center stage as the response as you know dr Mangadharan put it so well you know it's the host that matters not the guest and we are obsessed with the guest and we're forgetting the resilience and immunity of the host. So I think that is another very important area of policy. And these are areas where definitely Dr. Gangadharan and I would like to intervene, him with all his rich knowledge of Ayurveda, me with all my experience with having dealt with these criminals of our times through putting in place international and national laws. How do we, at this point, the most important thing is to defend the laws. So Mr. Gates now, wants to take patents to DSI. Most people will not realize DSI means seed. Digital sequence information. Just like Monsanto said seed is an empty container, he's now saying it's just a digital sequence information, which I have and therefore I have the patent. So the same patent law should apply to DSI. The same plant variety law should apply to DSI. The same convention on biological diversity should apply to DSI. And these are areas on which if you were to prepare short briefs on the basis of all our publications, if you don't have them, please get them from our office in Delhi. Your colleagues can prepare short briefs. Sure. Begin with Niti Ayo. Begin with Niti Ayo. And if you want to hold a session before Niti Ayo on healthy food and healthy eating and good agriculture, I am sure Dr. Gangadharan and I would be more than happy to hold a session to support your policy work. Excellent, Mannaji. And in fact, you know what you said, even I, while I was reading in your book, that this one patent is given only by 30 days of trial, right? I mean, in 30 days, they have the evidence to prove that it's good for humanity. Uh, and unfortunately, why Ayurveda took a backseat uh, during pandemic, the reason given was that Ayurveda is not evidence based. I mean, yeah, let me let me just mention something on this. Sure, sure, please. I've done, I've done quantum theory, and this much we know even in physics. It's only in mechanical reductionist physics that one thing has one cause. You know, <laughs> I move, I move this, and I hit it on this jug. That is one thing having one cause. But the world is not made of inert, immutable matter. It is made of energy and potential, and therefore. 
exactly like Dr. Gangadharan said, look at the whole body and look at the whole plant. In physics, we talk about it as systems understanding. And my work in physics and the work of Ayurveda has a total overlap. We realize that what matters is not one cause, one effect, which is what they talk about in evidence gathering, which is a wrong thing to look for, but a four-dimensional causation in space and time. So causality was challenged by quantum theory. It was challenged by uh, relativity. And we know even in physics, classical causality does not work. Yet they're imposing it on the richest knowledge tradition of the world. And we do need, you know, one, one reason we did the book is triggering a deeper scientific dialogue. Because when they say, oh, evidence-based, evidence-based means the powerful decide that this piece of information is data. And they treat 5,000 years of knowledge as anecdotes. You know, that's the narrative they're trying to build. Ayurveda is not an anecdote. Ayurveda is the distillation of the richest civilization on food and health. And we should not accept this insult of saying it is not evidence-based. The whole system is the evidence. A healthy person is the evidence. Good eating and recovery is the evidence. In a system, the system recovers. A particle does not. Evidence in reductionist physics is about a particle. But the body is not a particle. The body is a self-organized, complex, autopoietic, amazing system of healing. True, Anna Ji. And that's where I think the question to Ganga Dharanji gets connected. That how does Ayurveda cope with requirements like clinical trials, academic research grounded in one way of knowing, etc. Are there any breakthroughs in the middle part? I think this is a very good uh, question. <laughs> Add to what Vandanaji told, no, Ayurveda is a Pramana Shastra. We said it is a Pramana means it doesn't believe uh, unless there is an evidence. Pramana means the basis. We are, divide everything with the Prama and Aprama, which is actually existing, which is non-existing. So we, there is a lot of logic behind it. All Nyaya Shastra, Vaisheshika Shastra, experts talk about this. This is not a, understood by what we say to our evidence. Evidence is not in the modern reductionistic paradigm, modern in, a, in, a, in our own positive paradigm, it is that it can be proven. Even day to day, my practice is an uh, evidence creation. I, I do it by my practice. To answer to the question is that there are no major initiatives in uh, uh, Ayurveda for great research. One initiative I can quote and I can uh, take you home is that started by uh, Dr. M. S. Valiathan, a Ayurveda biology concept, which was started in 2003. And uh, there was a 10-year program we did involving some 50 scientists and uh, including 15 Ayurveda doctors on, not on any uh, clinical effect, only the basic theory of Ayurveda, how it is scientific. So one of the most uh, questioned thing in Ayurveda is the Prakriti. We said that there is a Vada Pragrudi, Pitta Pragrudi, Kapha Pragrudi. People have been telling what this. You cannot divide the human being like that. What is the basis for that? We say that Sukrata Vakte Janmada, Vishayana, Vishakrameta, Ishta, Sisra Pragrudi, Hinamad, Yotama. That we give big, big chance to Agas, which no one understands. And we did a study which started for seven years. And we covered 3,300 people, took their blood samples, and we categorized them using a modern method of uh, the analysis by uh, D, uh, by the computer institute, CDAC, and one senior physician. And we categorized all these 21-year-old people to three categories, Vata, Pitta, and Kava. And we studied with uh, CCMB, Hyderabad, IIC, Bangalore, and uh, Manipal University in Manipal. And I, as an Ayurveda physician, and three other Ayurveda physicians, we formulated a theory that each Pragrati has got these characteristics. And we categorized the 3,000 people into single Pragrati of Vada Pitaka. From 3,000 people, you could get only 330 people as a single Pragrati. That's what Ayurveda says. You don't get a single Pragrati very easily. Among a population, only 5 to 10% is single Pragrati. We got 300. And 
the Hyderabad Institute, uh, CCMP, came with a paper in Nature, that is the epi of, epitome of modern research uh, journals. Uh, we have established beyond any doubt that there are 52 SNPs which are uh, connected to the Kabha Pragriti of the person. And it is gone beyond any question that there is a genetic basis of Pragriti which is taught in Ayurveda. And what I say that Say that Shuklastavaste Janma, at the time of uh, fertilization of ovum with the sperm, the prakriti of the person is decided, which never changes till his death or her death. And this is what this SNP is, will never change. It is part of the human life. We said all the traits that is there in Kava Prakriti are decided by 52 SNPs, which, which has been separated from the system. This is one path break, according to this, one of the path breaking evidence creation in the modern paradigm. I don't say this is the paradigm of Ayurveda, but we could relate Ayurveda concept with uh, this. There are many such Prakriti analysis, some eight papers came out of that. What we need is no, if you look at the uh, general scenario, there is no budget which is needed for the kind of research we envisage to do. There is not even a single institution of the cadre of IITs in India. To do a research with a long term, a 20 year goal we should have with a five year, 10 year breaking goals, then we can plan. There is no such institution. Even the Ayush ministry, even the last uh, budget in March, you can see that that budget has not gone beyond the total budget of all India for medical science. One institution's total expenditure of modern institution is more than the all Ayush ministries on your budget, which is scattered all over the country for Ayurveda, Siddha, Yunani, Vamepadi, Natural. You can imagine what kind of fund. And they end up spending this fund for their salary of the staff. That's all. No money. And there is no networking. We don't network with the modern institution to bring up funds or anything. There's not happening. So what I say is that, as I told you earlier, the research in Ayurveda is only on in a lip service. There is no major breakthrough uh, service. Uh, uh, service. I don't even count any big research after this uh, in 2015 when Abdul Kalam was uh, promoting Ayurveda. At that time, he had uh, some research which is known as this uh, where ICMR, CSIR, and Ayush Mishri came. Something happened, but that also not concluded properly. So there are some episodes outside the Ayush Ministry that happened. Ayush Ministry is trying very well. I don't say the secretary present is a very innovative person, but he has got his own limitations, I think. We have to get more individuals involved, more institutions involved. We have to big, we have to think big. That is, we cannot think small and achieve all these things. That big thing, uh, big, uh, big thinking is not happened to the level Ayurveda deserves. And I think Ayurveda deserves more uh, people with more intellectual capacity and wisdom to take it further. We want that kind of capital. Even recently, Prime Minister continuously has been promoting Ayurveda. And he is trying his own way to promote Ayurveda, but there are no champions to take with this big responsibility of bringing up. So there are not much results. We have got very anecdotal evidence of rheumatoid arthritis is good in Ayurveda, is good in that, but there is no breakthrough uh, effort. I don't say result. Effort is not being done. Then how can you expect a result? That is the status of I in the country. Ganga Dharanji, and this is where let me assure you, uh, Rashtram School of Public Leadership, Center for Wellness and Wellbeing, which also integrates agroecology as a part of wellness wellbeing, is committed to research, education, and creating wellness champions who can work at grassroots and also who can go up higher and work on policy levels. And that's our vision. So collaboratively, let us create the future for humanity that very optimistically is also shown as a part in your book. And uh, we need to, uh, I love what Vannaji uh, said, Lagan then and Lagan now. So let, let's be aware of the Lagan now and, and not get carried away by the word modern or scientific because what is named as modern or what is named as progress, what is named as science can be fictional, can be challenged, should be challenged if we want to really reach the truth and live a healthy, happy uh, way. 
not just for ourselves because india has never been no, a country or a nation or a rashtra that lived for itself all of our vedic world view has always been for not just humanity for loka samasta sukhino bhavantu right so we include everyone we have always been a very inclusive culture we have always been a very optimistic culture uh, i'm very grateful to vandana ji and gangadharan ji for this book this time that you spent with us here uh and we we look forward to join programs and taking this forward and work on this together for establishing the dharma thank so you we, thank you mala thank you dr kadaran so we end the prayer uh, in the rashtram uh, way uh पूर्णमिदम पूर्णा पूर्णमवशिष्य पूर्ण से पूर्णमादाय पूर्णमेवशिष्य शांति 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 धन्यवाद पुनः मिलामः